Geopolitics and Empire is joined by Charlie Robinson, author of Octopus of Global Control, co-author of The Controlled Demolition of the American Empire, and Hippo Crazy, Surviving in a World of Cultural Double Standards. He's host of the Macro Aggressions podcast. His website is theoctopusofglobalcontrol.com. Welcome for the first time to Geopolitics and Empire, Charlie. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed our conversations elsewhere. So now it's time to do it this way. So yeah, on, on TNT. And by the way, next week will be my one year anniversary at uh, TNT. And um, I was on macro aggressions not too long ago. And uh, again, I, I just recently for the first time read your books. I got all three on, on Kindle. Here nice. you can see the octopus and uh, highly, I highly recommend uh, people check out, get your books. And I, I did want to sort of get into that, you know, just take a moment, step back, uh, touch on some of your books and see if you've uh, changed anything, anything in the way that you, that you think regarding them. And, you know, the first being the octopus of global control. Um, it's a book, you know, I would have written like a decade ago, but you know, so many people have put out great books on the subject with an extensive overview. I feel like, I don't know what else to say. You know, I got nothing else to yeah. add. Go read Charlie's book. Um, <laughs> And, you know, the, the, the big thing is you call it the octopus of global control. I had Etienne de La Boissier squared on recently. He calls it the interge intergenerational organized crime. People say Illuminati, deep state, Mr. Global. Uh, yep. Has your has your thesis changed? I think it's been six years since you published Octopus. You know, how, how do you view these uh, elites and, and what is their goal? To me, it seems basically the principal thing is world government is their goal. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely their goal. And the octopus symbology was not mine in 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 you know danny Casalero wrote a book called the octopus at age 44 and it got him killed i wrote the octopus at age 44 and i was like god i hope i don't follow in his footsteps love the book but don't want to don't want to wind up you know in a bathtub um there's also there's a quote in the book from john francis highland and he talks about this sprawling octopus with its tentacles in all of the uh, different areas of society, he's talking about finance and 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 media and the courthouses and every institution that was set up for public protection. You'll find this octopus. And he says, let me escape from mere generalities. I'm talking about the Rockefeller standard oil interests. And so... <clears throat> It's a three paragraph quote. You get to the very bottom. You see John Francis Highland. You go, who is this guy? Mayor of New York City, 1922. You know, so you go, wow, it's a century ago. And he's talking about the same thing, you know. So, so when you talk about this octopus and like it goes by a variety of names, it's just this, you know, it's this hidden hand. It's this controlling mechanism that s remains in the shadows when it suits its purposes, it is intent on creating a world government that they control. And in one of the components that goes hand in hand with world government, unfortunately, is also depopulation. So they share that common interest in eugenics, which has now been rebranded as transhumanism. So what you find is that it's a bunch of people, usually very wealthy, definitely very connected, that have that think, you know, this whole world would run so much better if we just got rid of a bunch of people, the useless eaters, as Henry Kissinger calls them, you know, the this 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 parrot, you know, the, these these people that are sort of on the bottom and they don't really contribute much. They have no respect for humanity. And they see these other people as as taking up too much space on their planet, you know, and so they 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 create these organizations that say that they're going to do one thing but covertly are doing something else they they there's nothing they won't do whether that be covertly sterilizing the population of africa uh, and third world countries or in enslaving people through their central bank fiat currency ponzi schemes or overtly controlling them through government officials which are you know, hired hands, cutouts to be disposed of when they're you you know when their purposes has been fulfilled and they're 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 discardable. So, it's 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 um, Etienne is is correct in his assessment of multi generational. If you if you know, there's plenty of um, there's there's plenty of horrible things you can say about these people, 
but but if you're if but you you have to at least acknowledge that they are very patient. They take a long term approach to this. They recognize that you can't get from A to Z all at once. If you want to get there, you got to go A to B and B to C and C to D. And you do this incrementally, and these moves seem very small, maybe disconnected. But when you pull back and look at it over the course of a century, you go, oh, my God, it's so clear. They've been marching us towards this world government uh, for 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 many, many years. And it always been a fantasy. And I would I would suggest it was a fantasy of of Genghis Khan and, and, and Marcus Aurelius and all, you know, all the people that, that sort of came before. I mean, I think everybody says, like, God, if we could conquer this city or this region, why can't we just conquer the world? But it's never been feasible until now with the technological advances and the ability to enslave people through universal money systems and 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 that sort of get you know people are expecting oh world government there this is going to be firing squads and everything no no that's too obvious it's it's more subtle than that it's controlled through legislation it's controlled through banking it's controlled through through your media it's it's the way you know it's reprogramming the minds of people to get them to see the world differently. So when I, when I wrote about the octopus, the, the, the actual animal itself is a perfect metaphor for this. Unbelievably intelligent. Octo, octopi can, they say that if they've been through a cave before, I guess they've done studies, it, they'll, they can figure out their way around. They can remember the path uh, up to three years afterwards. You know, they're, they're very smart. They can change their color. They can change their texture. They can spray ink and disappear to fight another day. They can grab you and pull you in and destroy you with a hidden beak that you don't see until it's too late. They're very slippery. If they can get their eyeball through a hole, they can get the rest of their body through. So if you take a look at this, and they're alien looking, you know, in, in appearance. So when you take the, all of these things and you go, yeah, that's them. They're very smart. They've got a variety of defense mechanisms. They'll stay and fight if it suits their benefits, or they'll leave in a in a cloud of ink, and you'll be looking at a rock, and they'll be right there, and you'll never even see them. I mean, the whole thing paints this picture of a of a very devious creature and 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 though i love the actual creature it's you know i'm fascinated by it and think they're amazing and mysterious and beautiful i i think that these creatures that that occupy places in washington dc the city of london the vatican and and these and dominate these intergenerational banking families i think these are some of the worst uh people on the planet a quick shout out to our sponsors, which you can locate via the sponsor page on geopoliticsandempire.com or whose links are included in every podcast description. I've tried privacy phones in the past, such as Silent Circle's Black Phone, which turned out to be a dud. The best and really only option so far is de-googling your phone. Now, you can do it yourself, but I've never had the time to figure that out and simply got an above phone. They sell de-googled phones that come with a suite of software. They also provide support and a monthly above privacy suite with many features such as a unique phone number, encryption, email, VPN, and so forth. If you're looking for a private phone, check out above phone. Make sure to click on the above phone link on geopoliticsandempire.com or via the podcast description so that we can enjoy a commission. Also, check out the Nomos Time Bank at nomos.net which you can download in Spanish or English to your Apple or Google or de Google phone. Nomos allows people in your community to exchange services using time as a currency rather than fiat money. This will be one great way to survive in the coming algorithm ghetto. If you need health insurance, you can talk to my friend James Guzman of the Borderless Blog Podcast and Health Insurance. He offers free consultations. Simply schedule a time with him over at borderlesshealthinsurance.com. Finally, you can donate directly to Geopolitics and Empire, consult with me, the host, or become a member to join private monthly member Zoom calls where we shoot the breeze discussing world events. You, know, you, you mentioned eugenics. I just, everything, they're whipping out eugenics again. Uh, you know, climate changeism is eugenics rebranded. Uh, you know, yep. today, the whole pandemic and, and healthcare today, the biosecurity, they're making healthcare basically biosecurity healthcare. It's uh, eugenics rebranded uh, on and on. And uh, just uh, on the world government again, we had the recent recent issue, the a bunch of U.S. congressmen talking about uh, the use of, uh, they want to authorize the use of uh, U.S. force in Mexico, 
And I, I view that again, it goes back to what we discussed last time. Um, I view that as part of world government because there was a document from last year that talked about how uh, Northcom, U US uh, DOD, wants to integrate the Mexican military, make it interoper interoperable with uh, the US uh, military. That's about the North American Union, which is about world government. So just to you know, hammer on that point that many events today are basically about world uh, government. And I, I do want to get your thoughts on Mexico uh, later on, but you know, there's so much going on. What are, and you asked me last time, some of the things that freak me out the most, uh, what are some of the things uh, going on right now that sort of are, are most concerning for you? Well, this, like you mentioned, this push towards this North American Union, it took the Declaration of North America, DNA, our DNA is all the same, don't you know? We're just going to connect all these things together. You've got Anthony Blinken and AMLO having a private conversation talking about a shared constitution, and then that gets leaked out and Matt Gates writes an art, a letter saying, what are you talking about? You're in no position to negotiate away our constitution with, a, you know, I love Mexico. I know you live there. I love Mexico. I was there twice last month. It's one of my favorite places in the world. Hey, Mexico, be very careful what you sign on for joining the United States. You get all the baggage that comes along with us as well. You know, I don't think this is a good deal for, for, for Mexico or for Canada. And, and it takes me back to these, you know, to these, crazy movies I was watching a million years ago, Freedom to Fascism with Aaron Russo, right? He talks about this in 2006, puts out this movie talking about his relationship with Nick Rockefeller, how they're they're talking about the North American Union and creating a common currency called the Amero. And everyone goes, get out of here, you lunatic. You talk, that's nonsense. Well, here we are, right? And we're having these conversations and we're talking about joining up, joining forces. And that is a... One of the components that this octopus uses, they, the, the, you take in individual nation states and group them up into bigger groups, right? The EU is a prime example. Now, do I have to control 30 countries or do I just have to control Ursula von der Leyen, right? I just, 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 I just need one person who's compromised. I just need one person who went to London School of Economics and is a trained socialist that's going to, I just need one person. I don't need to control 30, though they probably do, but, but still, when you, centralized po centralized power then you know where the control points are right whether that be in banking and money or whether it be in in government and if you can create an eu and then a north american union and then africom and then you know and then and these 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 regions then later on this long game that they play you then later join those regional groups together in in form in forming a, a world government which is what they they've always sort of fantasized about but i'll tell you that the the idea of world government and world governance is maybe a little bit different where where it's not so much that everybody needs to be clicked up uh, together you just have to have the same ideology spread throughout and then that sort of takes care of itself so we're i i get worried about the joining forces and, and w whether that be something like the EU or something like NATO or the United Nations anytime you start grouping countries together under one umbrella corporation or NGO or whatever, that starts to make me very nervous because those decisions tend to sort of stay out of the public. They remain private. And 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 everything that I've researched about, you know, the the, the way the you know the roads round table and everything, it all starts with these groups where they 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 have these these sort of quiet, you know, secret groups that are happening and and they talk about their ideas for world government and they get these like-minded people together, they train them and then they send them out as agents and install them in all these countries and next thing you know you're 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 voting on whether or not you're 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 voting on whether or not you should prosecute crime in your city anymore and you go, "Wait, what?" in San Francisco and you go well these these people are these people have been installed there in these in these these woke district attorneys so i i i have fears of the i have fears of this global octopus installing people in in all these positions all around the world but i have an even a secondary fear is that the general public doesn't understand what's going on and they don't see these people as being installed. They say, Oh, this guy's coming to help us. Or he's, he's reimagining policing <laughs> by, you know, getting rid of it. And he's a reimagining crime. He's, you know, he's going to treat 
criminals a different way by not prosecuting them and just letting them burn the cities to the ground. So I, I worry about the, 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 the overarching structure, of course, but I also worry about the public's response to it and how when you, when you take the mainstream media and you just brainwash people over and over again, you will, you can turn a bunch of people into, uh, you know, into enthusiastic cheerleaders for this new world order that's coming. And, and that freaks me out a, a ton. They've been uh, very successful uh, on that front, and I think your book Hypocrisy gets more mm-hmm. hypocrisy gets more into that. And um, you know, since you mentioned you were at Anarchapulco and uh, that you're a bit of a clairvoyant or, or prophet, you made a prediction, and I saw uh, in your macroaggressions you also were discussing it before it happened. You know, the 11th of uh, March were coming up, and the Ides of uh, March, and it's like 2008 happening all over. Uh, again, the Silicon Valley Bank uh, collapsing. I just read today that HSBC, or uh, as I prefer to call it, HSCBDC buys uh, you the UK operations of Silicon Valley for a dollar for a dollar, oh. and um, it seems like the dominoes are just falling now, and things are just collapsing. It, it's also interrelated with your American Empire as well. The, yeah. the, the, it just things are just everything's falling apart. The banks. Um, the war situation, uh, and so your your thoughts on the banking crisis now, and I think it's many people are saying it's 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 big, uh, and it's definitely I think going to pave the way for again the cashless system. I stood up on that stage first week of February at Anarchapulco, and in front of the, I was the second speaker to go, so we had a packed house. It was before everyone, you know, like like day five, you know, people are sort of hanging out, but day one, everyone's there. I said. I just want, if you hear one thing I say, you know, because the the presentation was on controlled demolition of the American empire. That's the book I wrote with Jeff Berwick, who is the host and founder of Anarchapulco. So it made sense for me to discuss what the book was about. But I said, if you just hear one thing that I say, get your money out of the banks. You are not, it's not your money. It's the bank's money. When you open your account and you put the money in, you become an unsecured creditor and you're probably third in line behind the the bank, the bondholders, and then you, if you get anything. And the FDIC, yes, they have some money to bail you out if a regional bank goes bust or, you know, the manager steals all the money out of the vault and disappears with his girlfriend to Tahiti, you're going to be fine, right? <clears throat> if you have a systemic banking collapse, good luck. The FDIC... First of all, the FDIC has invested a bunch of their funds in U.S. government bonds, which is which are the reason that the that the Silicon Valley Bank is having such big problems too. So it's like the FDIC is not going to be a, a a help. But but again, I think people need to understand that. And and this is normalcy bias that you know yesterday was normal and today was normal, so tomorrow will more than likely be, and it probably will be. Tomorrow will probably be normal, but when you get when you get those bank runs, they happen quickly. And when you look at and and people, you know, say, "Well, is this a real thing?" Is it? Look at Cyprus, twenty what fourteen twenty. They woke up one day and ATMs and everything's closed. You can't get your money. You can't. You know, they the the depositors that had over a hundred thousand euros in their account got a major haircut. They just said, well, you can't take our money. They said, no, no, no. Read read your paperwork for when you open this bank. It's our money. We can do whatever we want. Forget bailouts. It's now bail-ins. So they're going to keep the money because they can, because it's their money. There's no moral dilemma here. It's just banks making bank decisions that are legal because it's their money. So they don't have to explain it to you. You'll be mad, but there's nothing you can do about it. So I was telling people, like... I'm not licensed to give financial advice. I'm not going to pretend to tell you, you know, that that you should have it in this thing versus that thing. Just don't have it in the bank. Don't have it there. Have it, I mean, you know, mattress money or gold and silver or whatever. I mean, there's options out there and and do your own research and come up with your own ideas on this, but but just the idea that you're that it's in a bank and that therefore it's safe. That's a false sense of security, and I think a lot of people are going to to figure that out. Now, I, I'm not hoping for a bank run. I'm not wishing that, and it it has nothing to do with what I want. It's just, it's just math at this point. It's just that they, these guys have done this. They've printed an unsustainable amount of money. We understand that the banks are all convicted felons. <clears throat> so again, 
if there was a crack dealer down the street from your house who's a convicted felon, would you trust him? Would you give him all of your money to sit on it? No, he's as much of a convicted felon as all of the banks are. So again, th- this is the wrong group of people to to place any trust and security with. And and, and I get worried about that. And Berwick and I talked about this. In fact, w- the whole idea for the controlled demolition book came out of a conversation I had with him where he said, you know, it's all coming down. And I was like, really? Like what? What are we talking about here? You know, because <laughs> he talks about all kinds of crazy stuff. He said, the banking system, man, it's like a house of cards. I was like, oh yeah, of course. And he's like, yeah, it's all coming down. But in my mind, I'm going like a controlled demolition, you know, like building seven. So when we were talking about the book and he said, I have some ideas. I said, I have an idea too. What if we use the, the, the way you take down a building, you know, and, and use that as a metaphor for the way you take down the empire, you know, like identify the support columns, pre-weaken the building, rig the detonators, you know, push down the plunger, clear out the debris, all these things. I'll tell you, it's going to be rough. But there is going to be opportunities for people that are smart that that recognize that where where things are headed. And um, some people are going to do very well in this, but uh, I think the vast majority of people are going to get going to get real, you know, have to have a real honest discussion about how they view their money from this point on because these banks are very flimsy. they are they are not as solid as people think. And it's like one big, foot right in the door and the whole structure comes down. And we see this. And also I would like to remind people that these banks have like casino style games with each other called derivatives. It's like bets on bets and one bank bets, another bank and that bank bets you know, a, a third bank. And you know, there are, but if one of those goes down, you could be on the winning side of a transaction with said bank and still be losing because even though you won, the loser has no money to pay you. And so now you're a loser too. And then now you can't pay your obligations to the, to the other banks. And, and it, it just, it's all connected and they all kind of come down in a controlled demolition. So, so this, this, um, idea that, you know, it, when we, and Jeff, Jeff and I said, the canary in the coal mine is Deutsche Bank. Watch Deutsche Bank. As, as Deutsche Bank goes, the banking industry goes. And so so I'm not as concerned about Silicon Valley Bank, though I think it is a, a obviously a big, big deal. But if Deutsche Bank was insolvent tomorrow, uh, then we're in real trouble. And, you know, just to, to get your further thoughts on w- what's on the other side of this crisis. And again, I think you said it well, it's just a lot of things are common sense and there's not one thing that works for everyone. But you said, you know, take your money out, cash, gold, silver, some crypto, buy a car if you think you're going to need it, you know, buy property, uh, you know, and people can figure that stuff out. We don't have to bang on about that. But another consequence, again, is this, we, we may have talked about it before, you know, I call it the algorithm ghetto, this digital system. And the more I talk to people uh, or listen to smart people as well, it seems like it's going to be sort of patchworked forward. Um, it's going to take some time. And you know, do you have any further thoughts on them trying to push uh, push us uh, onto this system? Yeah, that's that central bank digital currency is what they really want, man. And and that is such a Trojan horse to terror. You know, I mean, the idea. Think about the dollar that's in your wallet, right? It, it it's a dumb dollar. It doesn't do anything. You can spend it. You can put it in the bank. You can spend it at the gas station. You know, you you have uh, you can spend it you, if you want to do something that nobody knows about. You can spend it in a covert way. If you move forward <clears throat> to a central bank digital currency, a programmable currency, and and to be let me be clear, I, it's not crypto. This isn't just like Bitcoin. <laughs> this is this is very different. This is a central bank digital currency that that is programmable, programmable to maybe just be used on the company store, you know, where, wherever that may be, all the, all the partner programs, all the companies that are in bed with, with the, with the establishment, the government that, that they allow you to use. Maybe it's the world economic forums group of preferred partners. You can only use this central bank digital currency there. There go all the small and medium sized businesses. They're just gone. Right. But also what if they get a, um, what if they get the the results of, a, of this Christmas, this last Christmas spending report comes in and it's, 
17% below normal. And they go, oh my God, this is terrible. And Joe Biden's got to run for re-election and we can't have this. And we need to, we need to do something just in time for the elections. We need to show uh, a lot of gr growth. We need to show money velocity, you know, increasing. And, and when, and they say, well, we're going to set a portion of your CBDCs to expire in 90 days. So get to spending, you know, and you go, oh, that would never happen. You go, well, okay, well, let's look at the World Economic Forum's you'll own nothing concept. Maybe you'll own nothing because you can't save enough to buy anything. Maybe all of the central bank digital currencies eventually will be set to expire. And and therefore, you'll be on a subscription service because that's you, you can maybe afford 20 bucks here and there, but you can never save up 2000 to buy the, the thing you need, or you can never save up... 25,000 to buy the car that you need, but don't worry, you'll own nothing. And part of the reason why you'll own nothing is because the mechanism that you use to save no longer exists. It's been switched off. So, so these, the, and again, probably not going to happen on day one, probably day one will be, we'll give you three to one central bank digital currencies for every digital dollar or for every US dollar federal reserve note that you convert into this system. Three to one. Oh man, I'm going to triple my money. Maybe, maybe not. And then, but next month it's two to one. And then the month after that, it's one to one. And then six months after that, we'll give you 50 cents for, you know, and, and so the, the incentive structure gets lower and you go, oh, I better get in faster, faster, faster. And next thing you know, everybody's in. And then the universal basic income kicks in and they go, oh, this is great. This is just digital money. And then they slam the door shut. <laughs> and then they make up the rules however they want after that. Well, you know, times are tough and mistakes were made. And so now we're going to devalue all this stuff. And, you know, and, and that's, again, that sounds crazy when we're sitting here looking at it. But again, think of all the other things that have happened in our lives that sound insane and, and like that would never, and that yet here we are. So again, that you have to sort of, uh, if you understand the mentality and you understand the end game, which is world government, world control, uh, you'll you'll own nothing. You'll eat the bugs and live in a smart city micro apartment. Then, it, where you just have to ride share everywhere in your fifteen minute city because you can't buy a car car because they don't exist. This is how you would achieve that. You've got to take control of the financial component of it. So when I go to a Narcopulco and talk, you know, talk to all these people there, what they're saying is. Give up on this current system. Forget about it. It's broken the way they want to take it. Don't even bother. You, you put as much duct tape on it as you like. You're never going to fix it. Let's build something different. Let's build a different idea because the current system isn't going to work. But if we can get outside of it, then we've at least got a chance. Yeah, I just, I mean, so many things are uh, uh, to go on here, but I get that idea and that's great. Uh, you know, and it's been seen throughout human history but going it goes back to what you said earlier that this technology allows them to do something that's never been able to be done before and would they allow us you know let's say we buy land i'm you know i'm here in, in mexico i buy land in the rural part of the state where i live in but then you know the the state government comes in they send their uh stasi troops with all you know checking you have the license and they have some of this stuff already like for your water, you got to have the water license. You got to have the, you know, the property tax. And already with the cars here in Mexico, uh, is the, the first this year is the first time now they're rolling out the like the emissions verification. And if you don't do it, the cops they, they can check automatically your license plates, and they're pulling people over, uh, and they can see that you didn't do your emissions check. Uh, you get a fine. Uh, so they're they're already making it prohibitive to have a vehicle. And the next year they can just change the emissions limit to whatever, and then make your car uh, illegal. Uh, and did they're just going to be increasing the in Australia? I was reading now on the highways at peak traffic hour, they're slapping, you know, ten, twenty dollar uh, fees. So when you go in and out daily now, Australians are going to have to be paying an extra 20 bucks, 10 or 20 bucks daily and their commute to work. Uh, and so you see them already ratcheting this up. But do you think that we would be able to if we do build a system apart that uh, I don't think they're going to leave us alone? So how do you think that no. would work? I, I I don't I don't know that it will ultimately work in the long run. Except I will say this: that when when it comes to these these World Economic Forum globalist guys, they may have a, a ten step plan to, towards putting their world government in place. But if they can't get past step three, then the rest of it doesn't matter. And we're starting to see that they're not as capable as we might have believed them to be. They would love for us to 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 think that they have it all figured out and that that they're going, you know, that 
they're going to say, you do this and then everyone will do it. Well, we saw what happened during the lockdowns. They, we saw what happened with the injections. We saw, you know, they, they had to sort of tell everyone you got to do, you know, they went through all these different levels of shaming people and then trying to outlaw things and force people and for, threaten them with their jobs. And in the end, there's still a huge percentage of people that are like, I'm not doing it. And they go, well, we don't know what we're going to, I mean, we've tried incentivizing you with free donuts. We've tried to give you laps around Talladega Speedway. We've we've told you that you, you will take away your job. We've threatened you with death from a, a dark winter. None of these things seem to work. Shoot, how do we get to step four when we're still stuck on step three? So again, I I, I think that building a parallel system, it, in theory, you know, listen, if they're, if they've built this, this new world order, smart city grid, they will eventually come for you. But again, to, to, you've got to try, <laughs> you've got to do what you can. You've got to stand up and deny them every step of the way, because when you do that, it empowers other people to stand up as well. It's like when you, those, those of us here in America, if you would go to a grocery store in the middle of 2020 and it would be like mask required and everybody's got to have a mask and you'd go to the grocery store and you didn't have a mask on, you might, you walk down the aisle by some, some people would freak out and get away from you. Other people would take their mask down a little bit, or maybe even take it all the way off. And so part of this is to, is to show strength to other people that we can do this, that you listen, there's some of us out here that just are not going to participate in this. We're not going to comply with unjust laws. We just won't do it. And when they, other people see that it empowers them. So I think that, you know, at least that anarchist community that I've, I've, I've been around for a couple of years now, they don't pretend to have it all figured out, but they know one thing, they're not going to participate in this and they're going to be a real pain in the butt for these guys going forward. And they're going to do whatever they can to, to not comply with, with these sort of uh, rules. But again, if, again, if the state has their way, eventually they will hunt down everybody, but um but but make them hunt you down. Don't just give in voluntarily. <laughs> Most definitely. Uh, I mean, yeah, j- be ready to fight with uh, all your spirit, mind, and and body against this uh, tyranny. And to get back to the U.S. Empire, American Empire, the controlled demolition. I mean, this podcast was born uh, out of my fascination. It's been eleven years since I've really started wow. started, started doing this. Um, a podcast, but American Empire, you know, I've, I've talked to Morris Berman, the cultural historian who lives down here in Mexico. He wrote a trilogy on the collapse of the American Empire. Johann Galtung, who's in his 90s, has been on twice. He predicted to the year the collapse of the Soviet Union. And he says by 2025, the American Empire is going to uh, collapse in the night. I also see that in relation with the Ukraine war. I uh, just, you know, my pa- previous guest was uh, Dr. Vladimir Kozin, who I met in Moscow six, seven years ago of the Russian Academy of Military uh sciences and i'm just picking up signals it feels like they really are going to push us towards a third world war i know people say yeah it's just a show but i think i think they're pushing us towards that path because it's a great way to reset things and scapegoat things but i i also feel you know get your thought on the american empire collapsing that i think um the federal sort of military wall street power structure will sort of remain strong but America will be hollowed out. Like the middle class will decline, yeah. infrastructure will be d- dilapidated. Um, but uh, you know, Washington and 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 Wall Street will still be pretty powerful. What what what's what what's your thought on you know what will be on the other side of this collapse, and then where you think they're taking us with uh, you know war with Russia and and China? Yeah, I heard Dylan Radigan on Jimmy Dore like a year ago describing what he thought. America would look like after something like this. And he described it as Brazil with 80% of the people in like lower to middle class, like, you know, like lo- lower class sort of. And then, then a small segment that's sort of above that in terms of earning capacity. And, and that's sort of where, where we see things going. And we, we talk about the American empire going away and we're, and we're not necessarily even saying that it's a bad thing. You know, we're not saying America itself necessarily goes away, but the empire does that this, thousand military bases, the world's reserve currency, the petrodollar arrangement that, you know, the way that we're able to lean on countries and get them to bend to our will, the, how we're driving NATO and doing all these things. Like when you, when you no longer have the world's printing press, the, uh, like we do with the dollar, 
then all of a sudden there's no need for the dollars. If the petrodollar arrangement goes away, as you know, then these countries that are sitting on dollars to buy oil go, well, what do we need these for? We, we, you know, we might be inclined to still use them if you guys were nicer over the last hundred years and you weren't such jerks about it and you didn't devalue this and you didn't lie to everybody and you didn't invade countries just on a whim and you didn't say you were spreading democracy while actually you were stealing their resources. Like we've made a lot of enemies around the world. And so there's no, you know, there's, there's no reason for, for, for the, the, the world in, at, at large to support America when they see it going down. It's like the bully who finally gets stuffed in the locker by all the kids that he'd picked on for all these years. You know, I mean, there's part of you that says you had it coming to you, man. And, and so we see America getting, you know, having to prioritize, you know, as much like in the way the Soviet Union broke apart, right? So you lose the satellite nations and you prioritize Mother Russia. Well, same thing with America. We lose all this other nonsense and we have to sort of prioritize America and and do the best that we can to sort of keep it going. But but we 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 mentioned things in the book like, you know, not all the decisions that are made <sighs> uh, hurt the country immediately. Some of them are like lighting a 30-year fuse. And I think about NAFTA as one of those things. When you when you outsource the industrial capacity of America to Mexico and and Asia and 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 you gut the Rust Belt and then you go, oh my God, there are no jobs here and all these people are 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 living. You know, their their standard of living has gone down and they're they're all broke. And Detroit looks like you know a ghost town and everything. It's like, yeah, what did you think was going to happen? Like like. Of course, this was going to happen. This is part of the plan. So, so again, we have to sort of get back to what made America great again, to borrow a a term from the orange guy. But, you know, like manufacturing capacity, improving our supply chains, taking advantage of the fact that, listen, we don't need to spend a trillion dollars on defense. We have two oceans that cover, you know, provide a really great moat around this, this, this whole country. Like if we were to take that that money and, and and things like that and invested into improving our infrastructure, improving our telecommunications, you know, improving our schools, which are uh, uh, just a, an embarrassment. I mean, we're invest, we're not investing in the right thing. So America could come back in a different form, but we would have to get really honest about what we need and what we want. Cause what we want right now is to be the world's policeman. But what we need is to make sure that, uh, rail cars don't fall over and explode (laughs) every week, you know, because that's kind of the priority here. So um, I just put an episode out called America last, last week. And it, and it, it just seems that like when you look through all these decisions that the Biden administration is making, and I'm not trying to say the Trump administration didn't make some of them too, but you look at it and you go, boy, we just, we just aren't even in the top 10 of their priorities. You know, America itself, like everything else is a bigger, it's everything else is more important. And, and, and even down to like, it, it almost feels intentional. Like the optics of Joe Biden, instead of going to Ohio to be there with the train derailment, goes to Ukraine, you go, that tells me everything I need to know. That's the priority there. Like that, that's, you know, so World War Three, Yeah totally feasible that they would start that to distract from what's going on here at home. And, and, and I worry about that um, because as we know, these wars always get started by bankers and and big business and it's, it's never really what it seems. And yes, it's sort of like Russia and, you know, depending on where you're, depending on where you get your news uh, media from in America, the narrative is Russia's unprovoked attack of Ukraine. Really? Totally unprovoked? You mean the last seven, eight years that nothing was going on that was provoked? You know, so narrative management, you know, stories are being told right now. Well, it's these the big bad Russians are invading the poor Ukrainians that didn't do anything. They just were sitting there minding their own business. Well, that's not true. And 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 so I worry about that. And they say, well, listen, China's now going to provide things. And you go, you guys want a world war, don't you? You know, like if I didn't know any better, I'd say that you were trying to make World War Three. And I think, like you said, yeah, it papers over a lot of their mistakes. Then they can, they, instead of having to account for why the economy collapsed and why the dollar is worthless and why there are no jobs and all these things, they can just say, you know, World War Three, man, it's just, you know, mistakes were made, like Rumsfeld always said. Yeah, I mean, and, and you know, I've, I've had this view for 
so long, decades, and now you know people Ed Dowd and Jared Salente and many people are saying this uh, same thing. And um, it, you know, it's it's more important to make LGBT rights in U- Ukraine. You know, th- that's more important than you know dealing with <laughs> infrastructure because yeah. that, I mean, that's what I was reading recently in Ukraine. Uh, uh, that's what they're doing and. Uh, maybe to jump back uh, to Mexico, because, uh, again, I, I talk to some people consult with me, uh, some of the people that jump on my uh, that are members of Geopolitics and Empire. We do our monthly Zoom calls. Uh, just more and more. I hear people, some who are Mexican-Americans uh, who were born in the U.S., you know, selling everything, coming down to Mexico. Others who are Americans, Canadians, uh, you know, Jeff Berwick's been here a long time. I know Josh Sigurdsson's a world of yep. alternative media is in Vallarta, Daniel Estelin's in in uh, Cancun, I, uh, I've been here for over a decade. And so what's your general feel for Mexico? Do you feel like there's a lot of people, you know, Derek Rose is down here. Do you feel there's like a lot of independent uh, people from independent media and alt media who, who've come down here? And do you still feel like there's a um, influx? And and by the way, my, my friend James Guzman, the Borderless blog, he just sent me a clip today of AMLO talking and he's saying it's safer in Mexico than in the U.S. And the, the reporter had a point at the end. He says, there's like a, been a record influx of Americans moving to live in Mexico. What does that tell you? If it's so dangerous, why are so many Americans coming to live in, in, in Mexico? So, you know, any further thoughts you have on Mexico? I love Anarcapulco, which is at the largest anarchist convention in Acapulco, Mexico. It happens once a year in, the first, you know, in, in February. You go down there and what you'll find is the people that come there, there's a lot of a ton of Canadians, a ton of Australians, a lot of Americans, people from the UK. But then there's a, another group, which are people from all of those countries that now live in Mexico and come to the conference too. So I'll meet people. I'll say, where are you, where are you from? They'll say, well, I'm a Canadian, but I live in Cabo or I'm a, I'm an Australian, but I live in Puerto Vallarta or, I, you know, whatever, or, or I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm from uh, New York but we sold everything and we moved down to to Acapulco a couple of years ago. And 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 listen, I was in Acapulco, went home for a couple of days, then had a family trip to Sayulita. And I we're we're walking around there and I'm going, in my mind, I'm going, I could be here. I could be here permanently. I could be here a long time. I would not miss the United States. You know, so um, it, uh, listen, when Donald Trump was building those walls. Just remember, walls work both ways. They keep people in too, you know. When you when you when it's time to leave, you want to go somewhere. Look, I I have always really loved America or uh, Mexico. I I lived in Southern California. Southern California, very quick trips to Tijuana, Ensenada, Rosarito. You know, when you're a kid, you, you're younger. You know, you do that. Then we sort of graduated to Cabo and Puerto Vallarta and in Cancun, Riviera Maya, all that area down there. I love it. I love it. I love. Um, I love the I love the culture. I love the people. I don't want it to be America light. I want it to be Mexico. I, I get I'm, I get enough America when I'm in America. I want it to be Mexico. I need to learn to speak Spanish. I want to do all those things so that I fit in in in, in a way that's more authentic. And 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 I just I like the people. I like the vibe. I don't know. Look, I don't know about the government. The government seems better than 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 our government, but I but I mean that's not saying much. I <clears throat> I did not see. I remember um, Jeff was saying he's like, oh, Acapulco is rated the third most dangerous city in the world by the CIA. You know, I didn't see any of that. I didn't see armed cops. I, I only saw one cop car in the two different trips I was I was in Mexico. So like I didn't it, it didn't feel scary or anything like that. But if you're an American and you're used to everything being I will say this, America is a little bit more organized in terms of how things work and how things are s- structured. But but Mexico has its charm. And in fact, some of the charm is in the fact that it's not as organized, you know? You're kind of like, well, you listen, if you want to Wear a seatbelt, wear a seatbelt. If you don't want, you know, do this. You know, it's sort of like, it's it's back to like it was in, in America in the 70s. It's like, look, man, do whatever, you know, within reason, do whatever you want to do. Don't don't be a jerk. But again, if you want, you know, in America, we've been having issues lately about, uh, oh, this, this minivan went down to Mexico and these people got captured by the cartel and two of them were murdered and two of them. Were... Listen, don't mess with the cartels. Don't 
do things that they wouldn't like, obviously. And I think if, and of course, you know, just try and be a, a, a don't be a jerk. But I, I saw, you know, in, in a Poco had that sort of problem a couple of years ago with some people getting on the wrong side of the cartels. And, and that wound up in the HBO documentary series about it. So like, use your common sense, but uh, I don't know, you tell me, you, 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 you're not leaving, are you? No, not for the foreseeable future. And those uh, four people in Matamoros, I mean, came out that they had a history of drug uh, selling and, and use in the United States. So again, that just it's, it serves to your point. And I just tell people like I've been here more than a decade. All everyone that I know is alive. No one's dead. And I was just I have to crunch the numbers. But I think it's turning out to be the case that in my whole life, it seems like I've spent the most time now in Mexico versus the you know croatia or the united states so uh you know most of my life now it's, it's almost where i've I've spent in uh, a majority of the time has been in uh mexico and so yeah I'd, I'd agree with everything you say and uh, i'm always of the point where i like to integrate with the locals you know get rid of that american exceptionalism i don't i don't shop at the, at the generally i don't shop like at costco's so i don't go to the starbucks i buy local mexican from the local yep. mexican markets to support the local and eat like locals do you know i'm I uh, became a Mexican national proudly. I mean, I, I still got these, I got these Canadian funded fact checkers uh, detailing all of my guests on geopolitics and empire and, and TNT and trying to make me out to be some uh, neo-fascist, far-right, Nazi, um, you know, anti-Semite. But like, would a, first of all, I'm a, I'm a Slav, so I can't be a anti I can't be a white supremacist because the white supremacists want to kill the Slavs. And, and I, I married into. Oh, you're a crypto white supremacist, right? And, and, and I, I married a brown person. I became a Mexican. Would you know? Would a far right white supremacist do that? No, no. But anyways, uh, yeah, Mexico's uh, great. And um, maybe to switch to the topic of your last book, hippo crazy. Um, you know, the wokeism, this cancel cancel culture stuff. I wonder how long it's going to go on for. Uh, you know, next month we got. The biggest Satan con, Satan, con, Satan, go have oh, really? in for, the U.S. My imitation must yeah. have gotten lost in the mail. <laughs> yeah, you, you should go. But um, you know, we saw Greta Greta Thunberg. Uh, you know, it was pointed out yesterday that she deleted her tweet from 2018 that said the world's going to end in 2023. And then, like yesterday, Rishi Sunak, the the PM of um, uh, Britain, he's up. He just upgraded his electrical system in his home for for heating his pool. While us plebs are all, you know, supposed to ration energy, and um, you know, on on one hand, when we talk about like normies, there's still a portion that look at us like we're crazy, uh, and then there's the people who get it. But then I think there's like a third group that I've sort of seen forming where they're not fully publicly on board with us, but they're neither with the normies. It's like they're afraid to make a stand. They secretly agree with us, but they don't want to uh, talk about it. So you know, a- a- any further thoughts on you know how? You know, we had those openly satanic, like, was it the Hollywood Awards uh, yeah. a couple months ago? And so, you know, y- your further thoughts on on wokeism and, you know, and, and anything else. Those people can come out of the clo- out of the closet. The, those people that are, that actually know what's going on and they're they're pretending like they they don't want to say anything about it. I don't think that the woke agenda has 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 a lot of legs at this point um, there. It's it's such a. In it's it's inconsistent with humanity. It's it's disjointed and nonsensical. It's run by you know cartoon character people that are not to be really taken too seriously. It feels inauthentic and fake that it's being pushed on everybody. It's being blended in with this green agenda. You start to feel like you're like, is this is the woke part? It, it's the, all the you know, all the, the alphabet people, is this part of a green agenda? And I grew up, I just full disclosure, I grew up in Palm Springs, California, which has a huge gay community. So I grew up in that, knowing that, seeing that, and it was always kind of out in the open and everyone was very nice and very accepting. And the gay community was, was trying their best to be accepted by, you know, the rest of society. And I think they did a very, very good job of it. And I think that over time it's been normalized and people go, well, they're, that person is gay, but that doesn't mean that they're bad or, or a predator or anything like that. They just happen to like people of the same sex and it's not a big deal. But then the, this new agenda came around and I think that it's going to be, I'll tell you who's going to break us through and, and get us in, in, end this whole, 
level of insanity is going to be the gay community. The gay community is going to say, we don't, these aren't us that these people over here that are cake gendered at lunch. And then, you know, this isn't our group. We don't, we're not in, we're not interested in, in doing drag queen story hour in front of a bunch of five-year-olds. That's not what we do. We might, you know, we have our own things that we do and we do them in, in private. We do that in, in West Hollywood in these bars and we, you know, we do, we, it's adults consenting to adult stuff, but we don't, we don't go after kids. That's not how we do this. And you guys in this alphabet soup, you guys are bringing a lot of heat under this community with the, with the actions and the, the, the things that you're doing. And it's not going to end well. You know, I think that this is an agenda that is, is very I mean, it's it's made to appear like it's a huge percentage of the population, but it's really not. It's just a very it's a vocal group, but also they're getting amplified by the media. So you have to kind of turn your eyes to the media and go, why are you normalizing this? Why are you making this out to be like, of course, what you know, we have to have five year olds read books called My Two Daddies or whatever. You know, of course we have to do that. If we don't, we're just we're bigots and everything. It's like. No, we're not. No, we're not saying that my two daddies is a bad thing. What we're saying is keep it age appropriate. Like you don't need to be injecting this into your into your kindergartners heads right now. You don't need to be talking to them about what your preferred pronouns are, that you're going to come out to your second grade class and all this stuff. People are like, whoa, this is I grew up not knowing what my teacher's first name was let alone what their sexual preference or if they were married. I mean, all that stuff. Do you remember if you'd see your teacher out at the grocery store and it wasn't at school, you'd be like seeing Bigfoot. You'd be like, whoa, there's my teacher. She's like a real person. I never expected her to be out. And now it's like, they want you to, I would have to, I have to come out to my, to my second grade class and tell them all about my pansexuality and all this stuff. It's like, no, you don't like nobody's asking for this. And so I think that this is going to have a whipsaw effect where, where you, where you play that up for, for only so long. And then the reaction is just like, we're not dealing with any of this. We don't, you know, we see this as, as, you know, you're trying to warp the minds of these kids. You're trying to get them confused about their gender. You're trying to get them to have, take, uh, drugs that 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 are irreversible uh, they say they're reversible but they're not you know puberty blockers that screw up kids we're having suicide through the roof we have all these kids that are confused about what they are and what they you know and look it's i'm i'm I feel sad for the kids of course because the kids don't know and the kids aren't a part of this but i i i have i have a ton of anger and frustration directed at the people that are pushing this normalizing, allowing it, the the parents that are going along to get along, going along because they're getting social credit points from their friends saying, oh, my little Timmy is transgendered now and goes back, you know, it's like, is this about the kid or is this about you, the parent being sort of woke? And, you know, all this stuff feels very artificial to me. And of course, as you know, because it's the sign of a dying empire. You know, this is sort of late stage empire. This is the sort of insanity you get when the wheels are falling off and the ruling class is stealing all the silverware and heading for the lifeboats. You know what I mean? This is what you get. You get busy work for, you know, for for people to focus on this, but don't look at the fact that the banks are getting looted and all this money's going offshore. So I, I feel like it's a it's it's a bit of a distraction. But again, it's something that you have to focus on. If it were just adults playing, you know, role playing, and this is like Dungeons and Dragons for non-binary people, I'd be fine with that. But when they start to go after kids and they make it younger and younger, and they start to say, you know, we're not going to discuss your pronouns with your parents or we're, you know, don't worry about your parents. You know, you can come to me. It's our little secret, all that. That's what predators do. I mean, straight up, that is what predators do. And so I think that in America, there's going to be a you know, a social war about this stuff. And, and it's, uh, cause there's, there's not as much of an appetite as people are, are led to believe. And I, and I, and frankly, I blame the media for amplifying this to the levels that they have. Yeah. I think you, the way you brought it back home that again, it's spiritually, culturally a, a sign of a dying, um, empire and, and, and you nailed it. I just, you know, had flashbacks to when I was a kid in like junior high in the United States. You know, I, I just remember I had a math teacher, like in, sixth grade that was Croatian and I was living in the, the northern suburbs of Illinois and she would just you know say a word here and there 
in, in Croatian in front of the class to me. But then she'd go, go on her business just teaching math. It's like I, I remember like the history teacher would just teach what they were supposed to teach history. And then the math teacher and math. And that's it. As, as a kid growing up, that's all that we need to. And as you say, now they're just shoving all this crazy stuff down our uh, throats. And, you know, I was thinking of my kid who's playing now innocently, doing all the innocent things that, you know, kids think about at this age. And it's great. And I'm supposed to now pump this crazy stuff. In. No, it's like, let them go organically about uh, living the world. And, um, you know, any, you know, further final final thoughts uh, for us then? It's not over yet. There's still a lot to, we can do. I know it sounds like, oh God, all this stuff is like so negative. No, if we we still have a chance here. We're, there's still more of us than there are of them. They need us to comply with with these insane ideas, whether it be the 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 social components of everybody can be whatever gender they want, or whether it be you know we all have to use these this fake currency and we have to we have to vote in the election for all these people. No, we can if. You know, there's a, there's so many of us out there that they need to control our minds in order to control our bodies. Well, take back control of your own mind. You know, turn off the television. Turn off the – if you're watching MSNBC, Fox News, and CNN, and BBC, and you're getting your information from that, you're getting – you're you're poisoning. You're, it's information junk food, and you're going to have a very – particular view of the world, and it's going to be the way they want you to see it in order to, you know – create this this world in which they want you to live in but you turn that off and you know what happens a lot of your problems go away a lot of this insanity goes away one of the things that in Arcapulco they were they've been heavily in, influential in and, and very um right over the target and, and especially after the covid years it's it's sort of taken on new meaning but the homeschooling side of things they pushed that quite a bit listen when you outsource your you know the, your kid you you send your kid to not a public school a government school. They said, make sure you call it a government school because that it sort of hammers home that you're like, ooh, government school. That sounds way worse than a public school. Well, it is a government school. And when you when you allow your kids to be indoctrinated with whatever the state decides, whether that be Common Core or you know my two daddies and 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 and, and woke science and, and and things like that, you're 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 putting them in in a place where. The, the state is the daycare center. And so you've got to take back control of the information that you're feeding yourself, your kids. You got to take back, uh, you have to take an honest look at what your money is and more importantly, maybe what your money isn't. And, um, and, and start talking to your friends and family and your neighbors and start to explain this to the extent that you can and, and really educate them about where things are headed because it's not too late. But boy, if we, if we allow, if we allow this to happen without standing up for ourselves, I think we're really going to regret it. We're going to get get to a, a place where we've walked into this digital gulag and the and the the door is slammed shut, and we finally realize, oh no, it, I think it might be over. That's a regrettable position to be in. Nothing is more expensive than regret. So do what you can now to uh, make sure that you don't find yourself in that situation. But 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 things are good. Things we can we can. It's not over yet. You know, I want people to to remember there's still fight left in us. You know. Yeah, yeah, and I just had a also a moment when you mentioned government schools and and homeschool my kids. Who, my kid was a homeschool. You know, I had a moment when we were in Croatia last year, and there were just like one uh, one family out of everyone was still wearing a mask, and my kid asks, "Why are they wearing a mask?" And I'm like. Because they believe the government propaganda and, you know, the, the, the government's bad. They're trying to install this tyranny. And imagine my kid being in a government school and my kid would have been thought, taught like, oh, it's, you know, what we're supposed to do. You're supposed to get injected and, and do whatever the government says. They're right. They're the experts. And so you can right away from the young age, you can see the, the different tracks uh the the kids are going to <laughs> going to go and um i'll include all of your links in the description as i usually do but uh is there any particular you know new project you got uh working on or you know where's the best place to find you well macroaggressions is the podcast that goes out twice a week in audio format wherever podcasts are available and in video format on rockfin odyssey band.video and vigilante.tv the best place is uh the website, the octopus of global people can reach out to me there. Uh, the books are available on Amazon. 
you can just search my name, Charlie Robinson. You'll find you'll find everything there, and you can or you can follow me on Twitter at Macroaggression, where I argue with the uh, robots from time to time, pretty with much Na- every day. With NATO NATO bots, well, I I hope to see you maybe next year at Anarchapulco, and thank you for being so. on Geopolitics Empire. Thank you so much for having me. I hope you enjoyed this Geopolitics and Empire podcast. The website is geopoliticsandempire.com, and I encourage you to sign up for the free email list that goes out with each podcast and every weekend with a collection of news headlines. The newsletter and website are our last lines of defense. We're being censored and deplatformed. It's nearly impossible to find Geopolitics and Empire on the Google search engine. We've been blacklisted. YouTube frequently takes down our videos with strikes, Facebook restricts our page, Reddit and Twitter take down posts, and after the Associated Press mentioned geopolitics and empire in a 2021 article co-written with NATO, our Patreon account was terminated. Vimeo also terminated our Pro account. The best free way to help geopolitics and empire is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or elsewhere and subscribe to all of our media channels. You can find the video broadcast now on five platforms, Odyssey, Rockfin, Rumble, BitChute, and Brighteon. You can find the audio broadcast on the podcast ecosystem, SoundCloud, Apple, Spotify, and so on. My current favorite social media channels are Twitter and Telegram, but you can also find us on Gab, MeWe, Minds, Float, VK, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Finally, Geopolitics and Empire is in dire need of funding to continue. You can leave a donation, purchase a consultation with the host, or become a member to receive additional benefits. We also produce a weekly broadcast called Dissident Thinker for members and Rockfin subscribers only. We will continue to fight the good fight come hell or high water. Thank you for listening.